Thank you. Just outstanding presentation, Dr. Chung. He is just, you know, he's one of the real stars down here in Joe Mill's program and just has really, you know, having, knowing sort of how to do this, you just did a great job of flying through a lot of stuff. They have, there's a bucket, there's a, a thing in the back if anybody wants an Adderall. <laughs> Guaranteed. You know, there was a couple things I was going to mention. We did some studies when I was a fellow uh, looking at endothelial injury and sort of how to keep these vein grafts viable and stuff. And it almost doesn't matter how you handle them. The damn endothelium is hard to keep alive. Does anyone know what endo a thrombomodulin is? Come on. Somebody, y'all went to medical school, didn't you? Thrombomodulin is an endothelial receptor for thrombin. And when it's on that receptor, what does it do? You got to know this. Somebody in this room knows what thrombomodulin with thrombin hooked to it does. It activates protein C. It's a, it takes thrombin, the central bioregulatory enzyme in hemostasis, and converts it into an anticoagulant by activating protein C. But it's a great marker of functional endothelium. So if you take a, a saphenous vein graft and you just kind of open it up and test it for activate of surface thrombomodulin, most of it's gone as soon as you handle one of these saphenous veins for a few minutes. It's real hard to keep it alive. The other thing uh, uh, Jair mentioned was uh, you can't mix papaverin and heparin. You kind of want to, but you can't because it precipitates. The other thing I was going to mention, it was an interesting point. He was talking about crimping on Dacron. Really, the reason they fixed, they made, the main reason they put crimping in Dacron, in fact, one of the guys I worked with used to order his Dacron not crimped. It just came out like a ribbon. And it's a pain in the ass to sew because it collapses on itself. It's just a piece of fabric. It's just real hard to handle. So the crimping was more of a mechanical thing to kind of help us to be able to sew it. The other thing, yeah, and stretch, you can sort of adjust the lengths a lot better. The other thing was the groin thing, groin incisions. We all have lots of weird, uh, you know, affectations about what we think works and what doesn't. Some of your attendings are going to want you to do all this loop closure and try to mass everything together, and some people are doing other things. I think you ought to use ligature, actually. I think the ligature is actually kind of, did anybody use ligature in the groin? It's actually something to think about. And you could, it's quick paper to write. Just do ligature on half of them, do half the other, and see how many uh, seromas you get. <laughs> you're you're going to get a bunch no matter what, so it's easy index to count. The other thing on these inframalleolar bypasses, bypass the medial plantar artery and lateral plantar artery, I don't know of a single patient I've ever seen who put a shoe on and went to work after one of those operations. <laughs> Just saying. You may get patency, but I'm not sure you get much else out of it. Uh, now, I don't want you, you don't have to look at that thing. He's two more amputations for the poor Grim Reaper. Okay, lots of, lots, of, lots of amputees in the United States, almost all of them from vascular disease. Trauma and tumors also, but more from uh, vascular disease. Diabetics, you see this question a lot of times on uh, board questions. Amputees are more likely to be, or to be dis severely disabled, they're more likely to have an amputation at a younger age, more likely to progress to a higher level, and they're more likely to die at a younger age than non-diabetic vascular amputees. What do you say, Spence? Should this patient have an amputation? Probably. Probably. I mean, would I, not necessarily. I guess the point is not necessarily. She's 88, she's on two pressors, she's multi-system organ failure, and she's DNR. You get called for this stuff in the ICU. There's a, the best treatment for that is what? Does she have insurance? She doesn't. She's, she's <laughs> Medicare. She's Medicare. She would get an amputation, I'm sure, in our place. Best treatment for that is Curlix. <laughs> Wrap it up. It's visible. If you can't see it, you don't need to amputate it because they're not going to look under the, the Curlix. Just tell them you're taking care of the wounds. The, the, and the family, and a little Curlix and a little bit of uh, Clorox on it takes the smell away. Families don't notice it when they come in on Sunday. Simple problem solved. Should this patient have an amputation? Again, you can't tell whether they need an amputation. Looking at the foot, you've got to look at the patient. So this is a 60-year-old nursing home patient. She's got fever, leukocytosis, pain, malodorous. Yeah, she's sick because her leg is sick. So really, gangrene, which means painless ischemic necrosis, dry gangrene, is not in and of itself an indication for an amputation. So I sort of think, what do you think of as indications for amputation? Y'all tell me, because you've been sitting here too long. Your butts are getting sore sitting here. I don't know how you do it, honestly. I mean, out at the pool, I've been out at the pool all afternoon. They're giving away free Grey Goose. So, <laughs> Clem, I don't know what the hell you're doing in here. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure what's in that glass. Why do you amputate somebody's leg? 
First reason, pain, uncontrollable pain. If you can control it, you don't need to cut it off. The other is, if the leg is harming them, how does a leg harm you? Well, usually it's sepsis, or it could be pigment nephropathy. I mean, those are the two big groups of reasons. So if you've got pain that you can't control, or you've got a leg that's harming the individual, then you've got to cut it off. Otherwise, it becomes a kind of a cosmesis issue where they get sent in from a nursing home because literally the family goes into Terrell and sees grandma for the first time in six months. They notice her foot doesn't look too great. And the next thing you know, the, the, you know, the nursing home sends them up for an amputation. It's not hurting them. It's not painful. It's not causing sepsis. It's dry gangrene. It's parchment. You don't need to cut the thing off. Again, you can wrap it up with Curlix and, and you've solved the problem. I'm not being entirely facetious. So if they're not, again, pain and, and where the leg is harming them are the two main things. Occasionally you see people who have, they have sort of an impediment to rehabilitation. They've sort of gotten into this loop in the wound center where you're just, you're stuck. You're not getting better. You're not getting worse. In the meantime, if, it's just like in the ICU. There's no such thing as being stable in an ICU. If you're not getting better, you're dying. So you, you must be getting better in an ICU. When you pass off to the next, yeah, she's stable, she's stable, she's stable. If you spend three weeks in the ICU stable, you're going to probably not get out of the ICU. So the same thing is true in, in sort of wound care. There's a point where you get into this sort of homeostasis. We're really not making progress, but the whole patient is losing. The sort of loss of, uh, you know, your, your, your integrity, your sort of whole function. There's a downside to... Uh, inactivity, sort of loss of function. So sometimes it's just impediment to rehabilitation. And it, lastly, is sort of cosmesis, hygiene, foot smells bad as an indication for an amputation. But not just the fact that foot's dead doesn't necessarily mean you have to cut it off. Selection of amputation level, I'm not even going to go into this because it just drives me crazy. Basically, you're going to use your, you're going to look at it and you're going to listen. If you've got a femoral pulse and a Doppler signal to the popliteal, probably it's going to heal. And you're always going to bet in favor of a person who has a likely potential for rehab. If you have no chance of rehab, you're demented, laying in a nursing home with an ischemic foot. There's no sense saving the knee because your BKA is probably not going to heal because they'll be laying in bed and kind of perseverating in movement and rub off your amputation. So AK is going to be a better choice. Racket amp, like a tennis racket, is a good way to do this. I like to do it this way because it's sort of the incision is, is vertical, so it lets your toes come together easily. Probably doesn't make a bit of difference if you do it horizontally, but I think the vertical rack, racket is a pretty good orientation. Uh, if you do a great toe amp, this actually was in a diagram that we did in uh, Up to Date, and it's a bad diagram because it, this is a mistake you make is cut too far, far posterior, suit too far toward, toward the foot with your upper incision, and you'll have to do a ray amputation here 100% of the time because by the time you get the toe off, you all go, uh-oh, I ran out of skin. So don't do that. <laughs> do that. Try to, you know, give yourself some skin out here so you don't wind up, and these are the operations you'll all be doing or have done, and some of you have one of these carcasses in your own uh, background already, a notch on your belt, you say, yeah, that happened to me. The problem is a ray amputation, a first ray amputation is a big deal. You know, you don't lose the ray, you can walk pretty normally. You take off the first metatarsal head and you have jacked up somebody's foot pretty significantly. Fifth metatarsal head is not a big deal. You hit your, you hit your heel, you walk up the side of the foot, you rotate across your metatarsal heads and then you spring off your big toe. Losing the fifth metatarsal head is not a big problem in terms of just the mechanics of the foot. When you lose the, the first metatarsal head, certainly the second metatarsal head, if you lose both of those, you should just, in my opinion, you should automatically do a transmit. That is in an ambulatory patient. Some of it's bed fast and you're, all you're really trying to do is preserve length for transfer, it's okay. For somebody who you expect to actually be able to walk, they'll be better off with a transmit than losing both first and second metatarsal heads. Uh, ray amp includes the metatarsal head and, and all or part of the uh, shaft of the foot, shaft of the metatarsal. These are actually functional amputations. We don't do very many in these sort of mid-foot amputations, but they can be pretty, pretty useful. One of the things you should remember when you start cutting back into the proximal foot, you start cutting back, particularly in these, but even in transmets, the way these things fail is because the foot sits in equinus most of the time. It's in equinus because the Achilles tendon is pulling up. Now, I don't know if any of you, I don't know if you ever do uh, Achilles tendon. I used to do an Achilles tendon transection. I don't even tell people that I do it most of the time. 
But I'll take an 11 blade just like a lateral internal sphincterotomy and just cut the darn Achilles tendon. Chris Adinger, who's a foot salvage guy at, uh, at George, uh, Georgetown, has been doing this for years, and it basically eliminates that capacity to push off, which you don't need with a transmit. You're just looking for a leg length. Eventually, it all heals back, and they have the capacity to have some plantar flexion, but you don't need them doing a lot of that. You basically want a full-length leg with a 90-degree angle at the foot so they have a preserved length. So at least think about Achilles tendon lengthening or transection of the Achilles tendon when you do a transmit. I think it helps the things heal, and I've had fewer recurrences, of particularly ulcers on the front of the foot afterwards. BKA, you know, it's funny. This chapter, this is a picture out of Rutherford. I think it's out of Rutherford. I can't remember. But uh, the, this, how long do you make this thing? Our, our people that do the prostheses, they actually like this thing to be 20 centimeters long. And I think we tended to cut them a little short in the past. Basically, if you can get it to heal at 20 centimeters below the tibial tuberosity, that's probably better than if it, certainly if you're at eight or nine. If you have a little bitty short stump of tibia, you're not likely to have a very good uh, stump. So longer is probably better. The disadvantage problem is you just can't get some of those longer ones to heal. But length is actually a good thing. There's a bunch of these different, you know, we almost always use a posterior flap. That's kind of the standard flap for most amputations. But there are alternatives. I'm not going to try to go through them because you've got to kind of think about it, and we don't have time this afternoon, but know that there are other ways to fashion a baloney amputation. It probably doesn't make a damn bit of difference. I mean, in other words, you, alternatives to a posterior flap work well. In other words, there are some people who've had fasciotomies or sort of some kind of weird ischemia, and if you, you don't have the big posterior flap, you can still get pretty functional amputations if you're creative with how you move things around. Uh, through knee is the other thing to think about. You got hamstrings on the back, quadriceps on the front. Standard old conventional through knee. Most people don't like this, and the, it's nice because it's disvascular. You know, you can just sort of cut through ligaments and tendons. You're not having to cut through bone per se, but it's bulbous. You got these big condyles kind of sticking out. Most people try to preserve the patella, and it's weird when you try to put a prosthetic on it because it sort of fits weird. You got this big bell to try to deal with. So most people do something like a mosé, which is really basically you do your flaps, but then you cut off the, 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 the tibia of the, the femur into sort of a square or even one of our prosthetics guys, he likes us to make this thing almost like a Q-tip. Sort of like, I usually cut a square and then I cut the corners like an octagon, so it's kind of created a, an almost rounded sort of a surface for the end of the stump of the femur. You get rid of the patella and it really makes a pretty functional amputation. For, so for some of these people who just can't take, and they're likely to be ambulatory, the, the mosé it's called is a pretty good option. You can see here where basically that's the end of the femur kind of fashioned off in almost a circle. It's a pretty nice way to do an amputation if you don't have a choice. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, too, how these uh, prosthetics work. It's, it's amazing. You know, if you cut the thing at, you know, through the knee, when you put your pants on, your knees are going to be at different lengths if you put a hinge on the bottom of it. At least that's what it seems like to me. But they're very clever, the way they design those things. You can see how it kind of folds up behind the knee, and so you don't look weird. Your knees actually bend at the same level on the same sides based on using that sort of posterior attachment for the prosthetic. Uh, Femur, you know, your femur sits at an angle. It's supposed to sit kind of at a funky angle like that. You don't want it sitting out to the side. The adductor holds it there. So if you get this kind of a post-op picture on an AK amputation, it's probably a bad thing because you've cut the adductors and so the, the femur kind of hangs up in the air. It's pulled up by the flexors. So a lot of people do actually make a pretty big effort to do some kind of myodesis where you take that medial uh, adductor muscle and attach it to the femur in a more aggressive way. Again, if you've know, you got a non-ambulatory, little old lady, demented nursing home patient, it's probably not that critical, but somebody that's likely to be ambulatory, doing something to fix that femur in medially is probably a good thing. AKA facts, only 50% are alive at one year. And if they've got end-stage renal disease and do an AKA, their 12-month survival is about 25%. It's pretty stunning. Energy consumption is a lot higher uh, with an AK than a BK. And only about 10% of people will ever walk effectively with a vascular amputation as opposed to a trauma or a cancer amputation with a prosthetic. Post-op pain, uh, it's bad. 
Phantom limb, I'm not sure how to handle the phantom limb pain. I really don't know the best answer for that, but it's, a, it's challenging. We used to have a guy at Arkansas that used to like to do preemptive anesthetics. He'd come in the day before, would do a spinal anesthetic, or, I mean an epidural, completely knock out the pain of the foot before you go do the amputation. And there, I think there probably is something to the concept of preemptive anesthesia before you do your surgery. Something you guys are young and you can figure this out, do a study, figure it out. 34% incidence of some kind of complication in patients with amputations. We all know that's true. You got a 10 or 15% chance you're gonna to have to amputate at a higher level. There's probably not a hell of a lot of good ways to, to reduce that. Uh, if you're gonna bet on, on, on in favor of the patient, you're gonna have some reamputations at higher levels. What percent of vascular amputees ambulate with a prosthesis outside the home? That's Oscar there running away from the police. <laughs> what do you think the number is? Yeah, it's not more than about that. I don't think it's, I think it is probably about 10 or 15 percent. It's, uh, it's not as high as when the rehab people come and talk to you, they'll tell you it's 75 percent, but I don't think in reality it's nearly that high. I think the reality is most of our patients figure out, well, look outside any VA, in the little smoking room outside, all those guys are in wheelchairs because they figure it's a whole lot less energy consumption to sit in a wheelchair and have somebody else push you back and forth to the smoking thing than it is to try to strap on a leg and limp out there. You know, they're like walking on stilts on a prosthetic. You got to balance and you got to walk. It's hard to do it. We're sitting in a wheelchair, it's easy. You know, you can put your drink over here, you got your cigarettes over here, and it's, it's much easier to function that way. Spence Taylor did a really good paper looking at what were predictors of the likelihood that you wouldn't ambulate with a prosthetic. Uh, and uh, obviously, if you weren't ambulating before, you're likely not to learn to walk with, with fiberglass. Above knee amputees, four times less likely to walk with a, with a prosthetic than if you had a below knee. The older you get, the worse it gets. If you were homebound before you had your amputation, you're probably not going to walk with a prosthetic very much. If you're demented, you're not going to be able to find your prosthetic, so you won't be able to strap it on. If you've got renal disease, again, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to be able to walk with a prosthetic twice as, or half as likely. Something to really think about. Cut off somebody's leg, they've got a two out of three chance of being alive in a year. If you cut off their leg above knee, chance of being alive a year from now is about 50%. I think those are real numbers. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you.